Ladies and gentlemen, here to light the candle of our first session is AGU President-elect Susan Lozier. Good morning, everyone. As the voice of God just told you, I'm Susan Lozier, President-elect of AGU, and I have the pleasant task of welcoming you all to this morning's session here at Centennial Central. Throughout the past year, we've been celebrating the past 100 years of Earth and space sciences, and now we're looking forward to the next century. This week, each day, we're celebrating different themes here in Centennial Central in order to promote networking opportunities and also collaboration. Today's theme is Beyond Earth, it is rocket science. So this week, um, we um, here's Wednesday, and so we'll still have sessions on Thursday and Friday, so I want to encourage you to continue to visit this space. And also, these sessions are going to be recorded, and so even after fall AGU um, is finished, uh, you'll have the opportunity to uh, look at these sessions and help you think about people you might reach out to for networking collaborations for outreach activities and educational activities. So my job right now here is done, except for the pleasant task of introducing you to Mary Beth Stoltzenberg, who is the president of the Atmosphere and Space Physics section. And she is going to have uh, introduce the speakers and explain about today's agenda. So please enjoy this exciting session. Mary Beth. Thank you, welcome. Um, it's my, on, on behalf of all of us organizers, it's my pleasant task to, uh, to also welcome you to today's uh, Beyond Earth theme. As Susan said, yes, it is rocket science. And I wanna thank my, my co-organizers, Christina Cohen, who is president of Space, uh, uh, sorry, of the Space Physics and Aronomy section, Michael Mishna and Rosalie Lopez, who are president-elect and president, respectively, of the Planetary Sciences uh, section of AGU. And I am, the, as Susan said, president of Atmospheric and Space Electricity section. So this first session today is particularly special um, in Atmospheric and Space Electricity, as it commemorates the 50th anniversary of one incredible event in the history of space exploration. The two lightning flashes that occurred uh, during launch of Apollo 12 um, in November of 1969 unintentionally led to an almost immediate enormous amount of expansion into the study of lightning on Earth and its environment in which lightning might occur. Prior to the launch of Apollo 13, that's less than six months later, the new launch rules were written to avoid lightning hazard to rockets, as we're gonna hear in our first talk. Those first discussions of, of how to make rules about this happened, where else? At the fall meeting of the AGU in 1969. Um, we're extremely fortunate today to have some of the people who have been involved in that, that effort for the last 50 years Two of the world's top experts in lightning and thunderstorm electrification are here with us today to tell us about this event, the aftermath, and what we have learned about lightning and launching through clouds since then. Dr. Philip Kreider is our first speaker today. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona. He's been involved since the beginning in developing all the understanding needed to keep the expert, to, to keep rockets away from lightning strikes. For nearly 50 years, Phil has served on the expert panel that NASA converged for this um, that came to be called the Lightning Advisory Panel, serving much of that time as chair. So for our first talk, we have Phil Kreider, Apollo 12, and an unexpected lightning hazard. Well, thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, back in November of 19, when was it? 60, uh, 69, the Apollo 12 was launched into electrified environment and triggered uh, <clears throat> two discharges, as it says in the abstract. And uh, I'd just like to back up and show you a little bit of what an Apollo rocket consisted of, the lower part the Saturn V and the, the second stage uh, 
uh, all were part of what was called the launch vehicle, and then the top part uh, is called the spacecraft. And uh, the crew of Apollo 12 was Pete Conrad, Alan Bean, and uh, Richard Gordon. And ultimately, they landed, they were able to land within 200 meters of their target on the moon, which was a Surveyor 3 spacecraft in a region known as the uh, uh, region, uh, what was it? The, I can't read it. <laughs> Ocean of Storms, appropriately enough. Um, so I'll be talking about what happened today and then a little bit about what the, the problem is, how to avoid that from happening again. The launch occurred 36 seconds later. It triggered a cloud to ground discharge that I'll show you. Uh, and the, the whole incident has been summarized in two uh, documents. One is a lightning incident report that's available on the web. And the other is the lightning, is the Apollo 12 mission report that's also available on the web. The mission report was published a little later and has many more engineering details of where the currents went when the rocket was struck and things like that. Basically, the, they launched the uh, vehicle into a weakly electrified environment associated with a, a cold front, a weak cold front uh, passing right over the uh, uh, space Center, and it was raining, which, so that is always an important clue to be careful. The main reason uh, the, the launch rules were written in the first place, and they all they said was stay out of thunderstorms, uh, the main reason for that was wind shear, because the, the, the Apollo vehicle was very sensitive to wind. Uh, but an analysis of the weather environment at the time of the uh, uh, at the time of the uh, incident was done by Lance Bosart, a very nice early publication by Lance on the structure of the cold front that went through there. And uh, the incident was recorded on video 36 seconds after the launch. And th there you can see a bright channel on the right side of the launch complex in these views. And uh, the, if you're going through it sequentially, it's top, the top left is number one, the top, or the bottom is on the left, number two is sort of reversed from the normal order. Uh, the discharge persisted, so we think it contained a continuing current, not necessarily a long continuing current, but a continuing current of the order 50 milliseconds. The, uh, an all-sky camera operated by Dr. Norton uh, from the Desert Research Institute recorded the bright channel near the launch complex. Pieces of the channel were also photographed by other cameras that they had around the launch pad. NASA was really big on photography in those days. <laughs> and basically, the basic analysis that's described in the incident report uh, indicated two ground terminations uh, at about 36 seconds, uh, which indicated that something had happened as a result of that space launch. The um, investigation that was conducted by the Marshall Space Flight Center, they sort of had three ground terminations, but typical, very seldom did the Marshall and the men's Marshall and Houston agree on the analysis. They had a variety of instruments uh, operating in the Weather Forecast Center. Uh, at various places, they had an electric field sensor that was a, a radioactive probe uh, made by the, uh, it was called Sweeney meter in the jargon, but anyway, it's a radioactive probe that uh, was a good sensor, I think, not terribly fast or accurate in a windy environment, but the, the sensors clearly indicated a hazard. The, the vertical scale they, was really not calibrated. It was just an indication of a hazard, and even the timing was uncertain, too, within the area that's shaded there, but clearly the electrified environment was present. The fields were high and agitated, and uh, 
the uh, result of this was two significant anomalies and several not so significant anomalies. Uh, the discharge to ground uh, occurred at 36 and a half seconds and uh, it, it took all three fuel cells offline uh, along with a loss of telemetry and many of the uh, um, other uh, instrumentation, mostly thermocouples on the surface of the vehicle. And uh, the a second discharge at 52 seconds was, remained in the cloud, was not photographed at the ground. Um, but then that particular discharge uh, caused the inertial platform in the spacecraft, the top part of the Apollo, to tumble. So they lost their uh, guidance system. The solutions to those uh, issues were very, very fortunate and could not have happened without a man on board. And uh, John Aaron was a flight controller and he suggested, uh, based on uh, experience obtained in the simulators maybe two years earlier, um, that try moving the SCE switch to auxiliary kind of to reset everything in the, uh, in the capsule, most of the circuit breakers that had caused the uh, fuel cells to disconnect uh, could be cleared. And then Alan Bean, when they were in Earth orbit, was able to realign the inertial platform uh, manually uh, using a, a, their practice procedure for doing that. There's a little switch that could switch the um, instruments from the SCE setting to auxiliary. It was a very obscure little switch down at the bottom there uh, in the uh, command module that uh, it was really fortunate that Alan Bean knew where that was because they had never practiced such a catastrophic electrical failure as actually occurred. All the circuit breakers in the spacecraft had were flashing red and it was really a bad thing from their point of view. Uh, today you can actually buy on Amazon t-shirts or coffee mugs or whatever that say try SCE to auxiliary as a, as a uh, rather humorous still. Uh, some of those say try SCE to auxiliary and relax. But the uh, photograph of Lovell using the uh, uh, realigning the inertia platform once they got to Earth orbit in the spacecraft and before they started the lunar transit uh, is shown here. Fortunately, Alan Bean didn't have any problem picking out the stars to, to do that realignment. Uh, and when they got eventually got back, the, they replaced it actually uh, uh, they had a display in the mission control room of the Yankee Clipper was the uh, sort of the logo for the mission and they just damn the lightning full speed ahead was sort of what they had as a joke on the screensavers in the mission control afterwards. Well when, in general whenever you're faced with a uh, well once so to quickly make uh, a long story short Initially, they had a question about what had happened. Was that really a lightning? Was it a so-called electrostatic discharge? So a lot of the pilots were already familiar with the little lightnings that come associated with uh, flying through electrified clouds. And so the, uh, at the fall AGU meeting, uh, NASA uh, agreed to present what had happened to the best of their ability and to invite comments from the research community. The people who were involved in that initial invited uh, uh, session uh, um, were, I guess I can show you that again where you can read it. Um, these are the people that were primarily involved in that early uh, analysis of what happened and decided that yes, it was triggered lightning um, and uh, it was a very new phenomenon or relatively new to be artificially triggered. People have known that tall buildings and structures get hit preferentially more often and uh, the, 
the idea of injecting a rocket or trailing a grounded wire um, was a rocket-triggered lightning, which was just at the beginnings of our understanding then. Morris Newman had uh, done that successfully over water in the Caribbean, and so the idea that you could trigger lightning over land was still uncertain, but um, uh, that was what we decided happened at that time. Uh, well, whenever you're faced with a, uh, a lightning hazard, you have two choices. You can either harden whatever it is you're concerned about, your house or your, uh, yourself on the golf course by getting under shelters that are protected, um, or you can avoid the lightning. You can, if you can move, you can uh, move away from the lightning. Uh, but in this case, uh, you can't launch. If you're going to avoid the lightning, um, you have to be careful not to fly into a cloud that contains high electric fields. So the, uh, uh, they, they adopted an avoidance criteria because the rocket itself, uh, it was not completely protected, obviously, from all the incidents that happened. Um, but uh, so they expanded the, uh, the launch rules to include cases where they thought the cloud would be electrified, it would be associated with precip, visible convective activity that extended well above the freezing level. And Jim Dye will be talking more about efforts to quantify uh, these weather avoidance criteria in the next talk. And I think at this point I can probably pause for, for Jim. They did decide that the bonding between the upper section of the, uh, uh, of the rocket, to the spacecraft system was bonded well to the Saturn V, so the bonding was good on this case, but everything else was very vulnerable to uh, lightning. So that's the reason they decided to uh, expand the avoidance criteria. Sure. I should have announced when we started we're going to save questions till the end um, just to keep the session moving. Our next speaker, um, Dr. James Dye, who's emeritus scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Jim is also a longtime member of the Lightning Advisory Panel and will tell us today about advancements in understanding as a result of the Apollo 12 and Atlas Centaur triggered lightning incidents, current and future. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Mary Beth. Good morning, everyone. Are you ready to get charged? Uh, I see a lot in the community here, uh, electric, atmospheric electricity, so they're already charged. But the, the rest of you, my talk is really primarily about how do we avoid regions in which there's charge and electric fields in clouds when we're going to launch a, a large rocket. Uh, there we go. So uh, Dr. Kreider just told you about Apollo 12, and we have a photograph here of Apollo 12 as the discharge is going through the rocket down into the plume. Uh, I won't talk more about that other than to say that obviously as a result of that incident, there was a lot of research that was uh, initiated, triggered, you might say. In the middle photograph here, we have a photograph of the discharge that came back down to the ground when the Atlas Centaur rocket, 67 in March 1987, also triggered lightning, something like 48 seconds into launch. Uh, and with both of them, particularly the Atlas Centaur, that was really initiated a lot of research in a lot of different areas and made significant changes too. A lot of the procedures that had been followed uh, were changed. There was lack of communication between the command and the meteorologist, et cetera. So there was a lot of that that was changed. Additionally, it spawned a lot of research. It 
particularly in rocket trigger lightning initially, but also in trying to understand more about the charge inside clouds, how they become charged, um, et cetera. And as well, it led to the formation of the lightning advisory panel, or predecessor to that, that Mary Beth mentioned. And this uh, lightning advisory panel is a group of experts in atmospheric electricity, lightning, cloud physics, that try to help formulate rules that can guide so that uh, they launches, especially large rockets, avoid flying into regions of clouds that might be electrified. And on the right, this is just a few months ago, this is a Russian Soyuz rocket that triggered lightning in northern Russia. So triggered lightning is still a hazard. Uh, I want to point out in the middle with the Atlas Centaur, you can see that uh, the background is very cloudy. It was dark, overcast. It was raining. Uh, like Apollo 12, there were also indications at the ground that there were strong electric fields. In reality, it should never have been launched, according to what we know now. So. I mentioned rocket-triggered lightning. I kindly got a video here from uh, Vlad Rockoff, University of Florida, where University of Florida at Cape Landing in Florida has an extensive program to study uh, rocket-triggered lightning. And they do this in order to uh, understand what the conditions that will trigger lightning are, and also a lot about the physics of lightning. If you're interested in that topic, Dr. Rockoff is giving a speak uh, tutorial this morning at 10.20 in room 104, I believe, upstairs. So what you're going to see here, I don't have a pointer, but I indicated the launch tube. You're going to see a rocket very quickly go up from there, and there's sort of a hazy plume following that, and you'll see that drift off to the right of this screen. And then about two seconds later, you'll see a lightning flash go up, and then followed by uh, subsequent discharges as part of that flash. I'll show it a couple times. If I had more time, we could step through it and look in detail, but uh, I don't have that time. So here we go. So look again for the rocket to fly up above. You see the rocket there, and then the plume drift off, and then the lightning. So in this rocket trails a metal wire that's several hundred meters long. Uh, I think they different lengths, but with that, then the the wire and rocket combination greatly distorts the natural electric field that's below the cloud and accentuates it and enhances it. So that triggers lightning. From studies like this, they've learned that if the electric field at the ground is something like five to six kilovolts per meter, then they have a good probability of triggered lightning. I'm sure Vlad and specialists in that can tell you more with regard to that. But let's look at this again. Oh, I don't go back. There we go. No, it's not going to let me. There we go. And there's your lightning. So as I said earlier, uh, from the rocket trigger lightning wire experiments, we learn what conditions at the ground are likely to trigger lightning, but we don't know what the electric field aloft is, because at the ground there's corona current, which sort of limits the amount of uh, field that you can have there. So in order to learn what the fields aloft were, uh, John Willett, Bill Wynn and others designed and built this two meter long rocket that has six electric field sensors, three on this side you see and three on the other side, so that the experiment was they'd fire this rocket first when they had, they thought a probability, high probability of trigger lightning. And then following that, they would launch the rocket with wire a few seconds later. So this is one of the examples on the right. You can see I've shown the trigger point. This plot on the left. Work. 
I'm too old fashioned. Anyway, <clears throat> on the left of that plot is the electric field, and on the right is the potential difference between ground and that trigger point. Well, in this case, and it turns out that it's sort of typical, uh, they triggered lightning when the electric field, about 250 meters above the ground, was something like uh, 18 kilovolts per meter. Potential difference between the surface in that point was three and a half to four megavolts. So we're talking about large potential differences. Um, I want to, most of you are not familiar with atmospheric electricity and fields we can encounter. So on a fair weather day, typically we have something like 100 volts per meter at the surface or a tenth of a kilovolt per meter. In growing cumulus clouds, before active electrification, you might get up to one or two kilovolts per meter. In active thunderstorms, get anywhere from 10 to as much as measured 150 to 200 kilovolts per meter. To initiate natural lightning, we probably need something of the order of 200 kilovolts per meter. Lightning initiation is one of those questions that we're still pursuing. So, <clears throat> so I mentioned that these experiments that Willett and others conducted, they found that they needed something like 18 kilovolts per meter slightly above the ground in order to trigger lightning. Well, we want to know what will trigger lightning up in an anvil at 10 kilometers, for example. So we have to adjust the 18 kilovolts per meter to higher altitude. We don't know exactly how to do that. That's still a big question. But if you assume it's inversely proportional to the, in, the air density, then you reduce the 18 kilovolts per meter to six kilovolts per meter. And then just to be sure that we're safe, we put in an arbitrary safety factor of two. So that reduces it to three kilovolts per meter. And this three kilovolts per meter is what's currently used in these launch uh, rules <clears throat> with, for large rockets. So as I pointed out earlier, the determination of electric field threshold necessary for triggering hinders our ability to possibly provide more launch relief. That's an area that we could significantly improve in research. Uh, well, in addition to knowing what the triggering conditions we want are, there were a lot of uh, projects or some projects conducted in order to try to understand what the strengths of electric fields inside clouds were. Uh, there was ongoing research in larger communities to understand electrification as well, but this was focused to this problem. So uh, Hugh Christian and his group from NASA Marshall led a project to measure electric fields using a NASA Learjet, and also New Mexico Tech had their special uh, test, <clears throat> their special vehicle instrument of electric field. Both of those experiments showed that, first of all, you could obtain reliable electric field measurements inside clouds. This is a difficult problem. I could go into details on that for the sole talk or more, but it's, it's not trivial. Uh, but they succeeded, and we can do that now. It does require care. In terms of the fields in electric, uh, in cumulus clouds, found that minimal electrification if the cloud tops were warmer than zero C. We've learned that the main mechanism for charging uh, clouds is primarily with ice, mixed phase clouds. Uh, you get modest electrification, that is fields of a few kilovolts per meter if the cloud tops are about minus five to minus 10 because that's where ice first begins to form in clouds. They only become highly electrified if you have cloud tops less than minus 20 Celsius. So the current cumulus launch rules are based on these criteria. Uh, there was another experiment conducted in uh, Florida near K Kennedy Space Center in 2000-2001, which was using the University of North Dakota Citation Aircraft Again, it was instrumented with six field mills by uh, Hugh Christian and his group. And we also had a complete array of microphysical probes. So not only did we obtain information on 
what the fields inside the clouds were, but also what the electric fields are. I mean the particles, the size, concentration, and habits. So this is just one example of many that we have. And again, we're looking in this project at anvils. In the middle panel here, you see the, the colors. This is a curtain of radar reflectivity above and below the aircraft as it flies along. So it's not a true vertical section, but it kind of a curtain. You see the aircraft flying at 10 kilometers, minus 36 Celsius from the tip of the anvil in towards the denser part of the anvil. And if you look at the top panel, you see the particle concentrations, the small ones are top, the concentration there, and then larger ones, at that dashed line below it. They're gradually increasing as you fly in towards the denser part of the anvil. However, you look at the bottom panel, you see that you have a very abrupt increase in electric field. And that's been a puzzle. I think maybe we're beginning to finally understand that. But, and I failed to point out that we're talking about 70 kilometers of path length. So based on these kind of measurements then, and we take all of those measurements inside anvils, we see that we have a plot of this nature where if we're in regions with low reflectivity and <clears throat> you know, that there's no hazard. We have fields less than three kilos per meter. It's only when we get to higher reflectivity. So launch rules are currently based on that. And I've run out of time. We've done statistics on that too. And these are things that we want to do for the future. Better determine electric field threshold for trigger and lightning. It's probably one of them. And then some others which you can read as I step away from the podium. Thank you. That concludes our session, uh, the first session, and we're going to follow this immediately with the, the plenary talk. Thank you all for coming. Ladies and gentlemen.